Hey everyone, welcome to DIY Guitar Making. Today we are going to be slotting fretboards, which I'm pointing over there because the fretboards are over there. So we're going to be cutting the fret slots and we're going to be doing that with a table saw. Yes, even a power tool as brutish as a table saw can cut those dainty little fret slots. So that's exciting. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But first, as always, let's answer some questions. Okay, and actually, I only have two questions here, and then I have a couple of comments from you guys, um, tips really from the audience uh, about guitar making. So that's you guys giving your perspectives and advice, and me just helping to disseminate that. That's great. All right, so let's get started. We'll do the questions first. The first question here comes from Noopy Noopitons. Hi Eric, question about the book matching. Is there a reason to join the top or back along the edge corresponding to the heartwood slash inner portion of the log or the sapwood slash outer region of the log? I seem to remember that mandolins are joined along the exterior edge. What about guitars? Can both joins be done? Okay, so to answer this question, I actually went over to my shelf back there and grabbed one of my joined soundboards here. And ideally what you want is the tightest grain lines towards the center. Now, generally what that actually means is the inner portion closer to the sapwood because that's where you're gonna have the tighter grain lines and as you can see, um, this is a pretty rough cut, so maybe it's hard to see on the camera, but these grain lines get wider as we go towards the edge. The main vibrational portion of the soundboard is towards the bridge area in the lower bout. So the edges are gonna be less active, so we're not as concerned about the grain lines being tight. Also, as we get further out towards the uh, outer edge, as you called it, the degree to which this is quarter sawn is going to drift off of quarter sawn and become just a little bit more rift sawn out towards those edges. Now, the tight grain line thing is really something that's important for the soundboard. For the back, it's not really a concern. Generally what I do for the back and generally what most or all luthiers do for the back is just choose aesthetically. So sometimes on the sapwood side you'll actually have a little bit of sapwood on say a uh, cool piece of zero coat or rosewood or something like that and I'll actually like to put that sapwood right in the center so I'll have like a cool pale white stripe down the center of the guitar. But if you like it the other way, and it actually can look kind of cool the other way, you could flip that around and put the sapwood out towards the edges. It's really up to you. It's an aesthetic thing for the back. But for the top, well, I mean, you could do it the other way. Say if there was a big knot or just some defect on the inner area where the tight grain lines are. Sure, like this knot right here, if that was in here, I would kind of be forced to flip this thing around and do it that way. But um, yeah, I think that's really the main criteria on the soundboards is getting that tight, those tight grain lines towards the inside. Uh, I don't really think about it in terms of inner and outer edge. I just look at the tightness of the grain lines and how quarter sawn it is and whether or not I'm drifting off of quarter sawn, which is again, typically what you see as you go to that outside edge. Uh, another thing though to look for is parallel grain versus converging grain. So when you're jointing this, you might find that one side as opposed to the other, the grain lines are actually coming in and converging. So then when you cut that joint, you would see those grain lines coming in like a V and disappearing at the joint. Aesthetically, it's, it's okay, but it's not all that desirable because it reveals the joint. And 
Uh, more importantly, it actually makes the joining process a little bit more difficult because the areas where that V connects and those grain lines connect, because the grain line is right at the edge there, it's actually a little bit harder than the wood, the white wood between the grain lines. And so when you're jointing this, you will likely actually find that it's harder to get a nice clean joint without selectively planing in certain areas, simply because those converging areas, they plane differently than the parallel areas. So best thing is to use, for ease of jointing, to use the most parallel grain you can get. Next question. That was a really good question, by the way. That's why I picked that one. Um, I haven't been asked that in a long time, and uh, I sometimes forget what is top of mind for a lot of builders out there, and that is the kind of question that comes up usually very early in the process for a you know first-time build. So thank you. Next question. Next question is from Walter Ryder. I love getting questions from Walter. Actually, I'm sorry, this is a comment. I told you there would be comments. Um, this is a tip from Walter. I use milk jugs filled with cement as weights. They do not mar the wood. It's simply cut out a slot away from the handle and fill. And keep the milk jug handle, keep the milk jug handle on the milk jug. Okay, so you have a nice handle for the weight. What he's talking about is you know, we were just talking about the jointing process there. Um, when he's jointing, and I'm assuming also when he's weighing them down on the joining board to connect the two pieces, I have all these big heavy weights here, which I just kind of happen to have around the shop. Uh, if you don't have something like that, what Walter's recommending is cut the top off of a empty milk jug and fill it up with sand and leave the handle of the gallon jug on there. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Walter. Okay, and now we got a question. And this is from Ryan Horn. How long does it usually take you to build a guitar from start to finish? Oh boy, this is always a tough question to answer. Um, and I'll answer it two ways, because usually when people ask this, they're trying to gauge for themselves how long it's going to take them to build a guitar. And my answer will like my situation will likely be very different from yours, especially if you're a new builder and you don't have a, you know, your shop all set up and everything like that. So for me, I don't actually log my time. So this is just kind of a sense of what I get if I, from all the guitars I've built, just kind of feeling it out. I would say anywhere between 200 to 500 hours. And that's a pretty big range right there. And that's because the range of things I can do with a build is nearly infinite. So on a really simple build, you know, very bare bones guitar, I might put about, I think 200 hours in on something more complicated, it would be up towards 500. And honestly, I'm sure I've spent quite a bit more than 500 hours on some really crazy guitars. I can think of them right now. And, uh, you know, guitars that, that have basically haunted me <laughs> for years because um, also just from a overall time span perspective, a build for me can take, uh, can be, you know, sitting around the shop for anywhere from about two and a half months to two years. So partially that's because life and other projects get in the way and sometimes things kind of end up on the back burner. So when you're considering your own builds too and how long they're gonna take, that's something to think about. You know, there's a lot of things that can and will happen that will put your project on the back burner and that can really extend the time out, okay? Um, now for a new builder, you have to research everything. Uh, you might take an online course like mine you might be having to you know invest in all the tooling and the equipment or at least some of it up front and of course you'll probably be using less expensive or simpler tooling 
than I have right now or than a fully outfitted shop would have. So that 200 to 500 hours would be several times more. Uh, just from talking to other students in the online course, and there's over 500 students now in the online course. So I get a pretty good idea. I don't talk to all of them, of course, it's a lot of people, but uh, just from the ones I do talk to in the members forum and in other places, I get a sense that the average first time build takes about a year. Some students I've noticed get it done in as little as three months, but the average, because again, life gets in the way and you know having to research and buy tools and things like that, the average takes about a year, it seems. And some people take longer than that, two years, and that's fine as well. Um, it's, it's just that there's a lot of different things you can do to a guitar, and there's also a lot of variance based on how much experience you have and how much tool, tooling you have. So that's it. I, I hope that helps. I'd, lo I'd, I'd actually love to hear other people who have some experience in guitar making. You know, maybe it's your third guitar or something like that. How, how long does it take you guys? I'd love to hear that, actually. Okay, let's move on to the next question, which actually the remaining questions are tips from the audience. So this comes from Steve O'Collin. I'm just now working on a 1940 00 style. Quilted cherry back and sides, yellow cypress top. I thought I might try torified maple for the binding. You cannot bend anything that has been, to that has been torified. He says, it just breaks, so he switched to black walnut. Thank you for that. Um, that's interesting. I didn't know that about torrified wood that, I mean, it makes sense with what the wood is going through that it becomes brittle and it, it just can't survive the stress of bending. Now, there's no reason to bend, to use torrified wood for binding, you know, uh, as we talked about in the last episode of DIY Guitar Making, where I talked a lot about torrified wood. The whole purpose of torrefaction is one, for stability, and two, for tone. You're boiling out those oils and organic compounds to make the wood basically lighter and more brittle, which makes it more responsive. Doesn't matter for your binding, and it also doesn't matter for the sides. So there's no reason to bend it. Although I'm sure, I'm sure he didn't get it. He didn't buy, purchase torrified wood in order to use it for the binding. Uh, he probably had it around and just thought, hey, this will work. But that's good to know because other people will likely end up in that same situation where they have what they have and they think, well, I can cut this down into thin strips and bend it and just use this for my binding. Don't do that. Or so says Steve O'Collin. Don't bend torrified wood. That is interesting and it makes sense that it would break. All right, Sam Bowman writes, an old cabinet builder taught me a trick about glue squeeze out several years back. You can take a simple drinking straw with either open, e with either open end against the corner of your piece and run it along the corner to scoop up the squeeze out. It will conform to the square corner and a simple wipe of a rag afterwards and your corner will be clean. Afterwards, a mash and pull with your fingers and your straw has been cleared out, cleaned out for reuse over and over. Cutting a small angle on the end of the straw works even better. What's funny about this is one of my students uh, two, two or three years ago, Vincent Arnold, if you're out there, uh, he took my course and he mentioned this little trick. And uh, honestly, uh, I'm ashamed to say I never actually tried it, but this is the second time I'm hearing about it. And it sounds like it is a great idea. So I'd, I, you know what? I'm gonna try that pretty soon on one of my next builds, taking a straw, cutting a little angle into the end and just using that to scoop up the squeeze out. And then on each, glue up after you're done, just nip the end off the straw and you're good to go for the next one. 
I'd imagine it would work really well. So that's the second time I heard it. That validates it a little bit more for me. It's a great idea. Thanks, man. Okay. That's it. That's our questions slash comments for the day. Why don't we do some fret slotting? Let's go do that. Okay, guys. Here we are in my work in progress back area of the shop where I'm keeping all of my power tools right now. And um, I've already talked about that a lot, so I'm not going to get into the shop remodel kind of stuff. We're here to do some fret slotting. I have a bunch of fret boards here, which have double stick tape stuck to them right now. I'll get to that in a moment. Just to show you a finished example, we always start when you're fret slotting, it is really required that you start with a square blank. You don't want that taper that you will eventually put onto the fretboard. You don't want the taper into your fretboard or any of the shaping on the tongue or anything like that. Just a square billet. And it's important that at least one edge is nice and flat, true, like this one is. Okay. Actually, let me just double check this. I have a light up here in the ceiling. I can hold it up to the light. And yes, this edge looks like my good edge. All right, so let me talk about my setup here a little bit. What you can't really see, maybe you can see it in the camera and maybe you'll see it better if I remove this. I have a specialty blade in here before I touch this. I'll unplug it just to be safe. I have a specialty fret slotting blade in here. This one's from Stu Mac. You can get literally the same thing from Luthier's Mercantile. They both sell it. And what it is, is it is a table saw blade with a 23 thousandths of an inch kerf. 23 thousandths of an inch is just your most common dimension for the tang of the fret wire. The tang is that little bottom end of the T-shape. It's the portion of the fret wire that goes into the fret board. So if our fret slots match the tang, we've got a good fit then. Now this whole blade isn't 23 thousandths of an inch thick because if it was, the blade would be incredibly unstable and wobbly which you'd run into all kinds of problems with kickback and uh, I don't know, maybe the blade um, warping or breaking. It would just be too unstable. So what they've done here with these specialty blades is they're much thicker towards the middle of the blade where it anchors in so that it's nice and thick and stout and stable. And it's really just right at the very edge, the outside edge it's 23 thousandths of an inch. Okay, so I don't use this blade for anything other than this. If I'm doing any other operation on the table saw, I'm taking this blade out. Let's put this back on, lock that up. Okay, and other than that, what I have is a template. This one is also from Stuart McDonald. Again, I believe Luthier's Mercantile sells the same thing. So you can get it from either source. And it is a template, a metal template with a short scale on this side actually, and a long scale on this side. So I can do two different types of fretboards with this one template here. I'm gonna be using the long scale in this particular case so we're going to use this side with all the uh, black numbers that I've marked here. Oh, and um, yeah, let me explain the template a little bit further. So it has all these little notches, and this fence here has a little index pin. So just a little metal pin 
right there. It's very small, so if you can't see it, I apologize, but it's right there. And so I'm going to stick my template down to the fretboard, and then we can take the two of these, and I will go fret by fret, placing the notch onto that little pin. Then I cut it, then I'll move to the next notch, cut that one, move to the next notch, cut that one. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Now to get this on here, I'll just place this against the fence. And while holding this flush against the fence, I'll take the, the white backing paper off of my double stick tape and place this down. Okay. Now the template is wider than my fretboard piece. So it's kind of hard for me to press the fretboard in flush against the fence if I can't really reach my finger under it. So just a little tip there. I just take my straight edge or, you know, I could use a, just a flat piece of wood for this that would work too. And I keep that there so that all I have to do to press this against the fence is press on the straight edge. Right? So let's peel the backing off carefully so I don't peel the adhesive off. There it is. Now these are already thickness to um, 0.25 inch, quarter inch. All right, so now I'm going to place this on there, making sure all my little notches are on the fretboard. Um, I, so I said my fretboards are 0.25 inch, but uh, that's not necessarily like a standard to have them at at this stage. That's just what I have them at right now. So I used to actually do them at 0.3 inch. And uh, over time, I, I lowered that down for, uh, for not very interesting reasons that I'm not going to get into. But anyway, you're situation might be different so depending on what you're building and what your build process is all right so i've got that on there nice and tight i need ears and eyes so i'm going to put my eyes on and i'm going to put these on in a moment um, but first i'll explain a couple things because once this is running, you won't be able to hear me. Uh, so, these templates have 24 notches on them. So for 24 fret slots, the first notch, by the way, is for the nut. So technically, there's 25 notches on here. The first notch is not a fret, it's the nut. And... Uh, so you, you should, in most cases, unless you're building an electric guitar, you should have extra fret slots down here at the end. What I like to do is I use those extra fret slots to set and check the height of my table saw blade. So what you're not seeing here is I already have the height of my blade set up. In my situation here, I'm cutting these slots to an eighth of an inch, okay? Again, that's very situation dependent. So depending on your build process, you might do something slightly different. But I'm cutting them to an eighth of an inch and uh, I already have that set. If I wanted to double check that, I would use these, uh, the 24th and the 23rd fret way down here in the end because that's all going to get cut off anyway. Now on these guitars, I'll be doing 20 frets. So I'm going to start at the 20 and work my way down to the nut down on this end. And that 
yeah, that's pretty much it. Let me do a cut and then we'll we'll take a look at it. It's always a good idea to check out your first cut before you start doing the other ones. And again, even better idea to do the test cut down here so you don't ruin your fretboard. But since I have already had this set up for a while and have already been batching out fretboards, I know my setup is good, but I'm just showing you here how you can double check this. Just keep a little straight edge, or I'm sorry, a square nearby, and you can check by holding your square up to your slot and checking it like that. And then for the depth of the slot, I just use these little Stumac string action gauges, but any ruler, as long as it's thin enough to get into that slot, you can use to get a reading. And this one it has a 64th thousands of, 64th of an inch scale on it, which is nice and precise. So I like to do that. So I'm looking for 8 64ths, which of course is an eighth of an inch. And that looks good. All right, let's keep moving down the line. So now we're doing, I just did 20, now we're doing 19. The order actually doesn't matter. You could start at the other end and, and go that way. Um, you could even do every other and then come back and get do the odds and then the evens. Be kind of weird. There's no reason to do that. But it, it also doesn't matter because each fret slot doesn't depend on the one before it. The fretboard is already stuck down to the template. So if you, let's say, accidentally skip one of the slots, it really doesn't matter as long as you take a look at your board, you notice that you skipped one, and you go back to that slot and you cut it then. So it's really a pretty dumb process once you've nailed the setup. All right, let's knock them out. What's funny there is I actually did just skip one. I skipped the 19th. Doesn't matter. I'm going to do 19 now. Anyway, just wanted to tell you that.
All right. There we have it. So now I can remove the board, the fretboard from the template with this wonderful fish spatula right here. By the way, is my favorite template and glue removal spatula is simply a fish spatula, which also has the side benefit of being great for grilling fish. So if you're doing any fish grilling in the shop, well, there you go. All right. Let's take this. What's nice is this spatula has kind of a flex to it just the way that shape is so it actually helps pry as you're pushing it in that's why I like it all right and then I like to get the double stick tape off of there right away because if you leave it on there overnight or something like that it just becomes harder to remove but it's real easy as you can see to remove right now cool so that's it I'm gonna keep on going down the line making these fretboards these fretboards are for the fall workshops um, most of them are for the fall workshops some of them are for my own builds that I'm doing uh, the fall workshops by the way are all filled up but there are workshops in the spring of 2023 if you want to get in one and you missed the fall check out spring all right i don't think i have anything else to say about that right now so i think we're done here folks this was fun uh, i've had a good time answering your questions and giving you this demonstration right here i will see you guys in the next one i'll answer more of your questions and we'll do more fun stuff like this bye for now if you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.